So Germany has a brand new uh, chancellor, uh, our prime minister, uh, chance, uh, well, chancellor, Olaf Scholz, and he's got a brand new problem uh, the, in, in the province of, or state of Saxony, which uh, is probably one of the most conservative, if not the most conservative, I'd put it right up there with Bavaria uh, in Germany, uh, also the most unvaccinated. Uh, there is a plot to kill politicians who are calling for vaccine mandates. And they are just busting this thing. It's over at CNN and BBC. It's all over the planet. Um, these are anti-vax, anti-science freaks who are now planning murder. Where does this stuff come from? What do we do about it? How do we respond to it? Lee McIntyre is on the line with us. Uh, Lee is a research fellow at the Center for Philosophy and History of Science at Boston University, an instructor in ethics at Harvard Extension School, formerly executive director and Institute of Qualitative si Social Science at Harvard University, the author of latest uh, 11 books, his latest, How to Talk to a Science Denier, Conversations with Flat Earthers, Climate Deniers, and Others Who Defy Reason. Lee, welcome to the program. I loved your uh, conversation with the uh, the flat Earth guy, where you were describing the uh, the artifacts of vision from you know heat inversions and things. Um, uh, how uh, well, first of all, how prevalent is science denial in our society? And and also, I, I was I was boggled by your description of how South Africa was ravaged by AIDS because their president became a science denier. Um, how prevalent is this in our country? How prevalent is, is this around the world? And what's the, the cultural and psychological basis of these kinds of, uh, this kind of thinking? Well, thanks so much for having me on the program. I appreciate it. Um, I, I'm not sure that there are um, uh, statistics uh, on how prevalent it is. My feeling is that it's been getting worse over the, the last several years because it's no longer just about science denial but about reality denial, because the folks uh, had so much success with, uh, you know, all of the, the science denial programs that, it, you know, it, it's now metastasized to these uh, other areas. There, there was some measurement a few years back, uh, kind of a worldwide survey in which they found that, you know, of course, the United States is number one for uh, climate denial. Um, and, you know, we were not number one for all areas of science denial. I think Turkey had its beat uh, for uh, evolution denial. But this seems to be something that is happening uh, with a good, de good degree of frequency in the United States. And there's a reason for that. It's because we're being targeted with disinformation. And to, uh, now I, I know with regard to climate denialism, we were targeted for, for decades by big fossil fuel companies and their front men and and, and, right. and you know and fossil fuel billionaires um, that seems to be on the decline or who else is targeting us with misinformation and about what well it, it depends on the area um, I heard you say in the in the intro you're talking about people who are anti-science of course nobody would really characterize themselves that way or even as a denier they tend to think of themselves as more scientific than the scientists but I would say that there are very few people actually who are anti-science uh, science deniers tend to be selective. They uh, really only object to those scientific areas that tread on some sacred belief that they have, maybe some ideological belief uh, around vaccines, around the shape of the earth, um, you know, around COVID. And then uh, the information gets weaponized and then they know what the talking points are and they know how to push back. But they're, they're usually not anti-science, you know, just uh, per se. I, I would say the most dangerous areas of science denial right now are, of course, COVID denial and climate denial. But as you said a few minutes ago, so, I mean, science denial uh, has been around for a long time, and it can kill. There were 300,000 deaths in uh, South Africa a few years back because President Mbeke and his uh, uh, health minister, Zimang, uh, insisted that uh, AZT was part of a Western plot and could be that a HIV AIDS could be treated with garlic and lemon juice. When disinformation is put in the hands of somebody like that who's influential, it can kill hundreds of thousands of people. So Donald Trump was promoting science denialism with regard to climate change. Uh, I, I believe probably still continues to. Um, we've yeah. got this this movement in the United States denying the reality that COVID. In fact, I just a couple of days ago, I was talking with a, an old friend of mine from college, um, uh, the the wife of an old friend. He just had a heart attack, and and I'm like, what happened? And 
oh, he got pneumonia and then he had a heart attack. And I'm like, whoa, that sounds like a COVID, uh, you know, uh, scenario. And she's like, uh, oh, we don't believe in COVID. You know, the, uh, the, those vaccines, they can kill you. You don't want to, you don't want to. And I'm like, oh, my God. And this is somebody that, you know, I've, I've known for 50 years. Um, how do you, you, you know, let me ask the question of your book, the title of your book. How do you talk to a science denier? Uh, it's, it's hard because you have to face the fact when you're going into the conversation that their beliefs are not probably based on facts and evidence. So you can't talk to them, at least initially, about facts and evidence. I mean, if you think about it, how could their be, views be based on facts and evidence, right? But it's very hard because in these conversations, uh, maybe, you know, folks, uh, I know I felt this in talking to Flat Earthers, you have this feeling that you just you want to debunk them on the spot, drop the mic. But if you do that, you just alienate them, and there's really no way to have any sort of a satisfying conversation. I'd say the most important thing to know about you know such talks is that you have to approach the person with patience and respect, respect for them as a person, even if not their ideas, and you have to listen. Because really, if you think about it, science denial is not just about doubt, it's about distrust. If the per because they, the person has been taught not to trust people on the other team. And if they don't trust you, facts are not going to win the day. So, you know, talk to them face to face and try to win their trust. And then maybe over time, they'll listen to the facts. Yeah, you know, it seems like a, a good strategy. I'm not sure it worked for me, you know, a couple of days ago when I had this phone conversation. Although I did, you know, I said, you know, you're being lied to. I mean, the, the, there are people who are, you know, does that, that doesn't work? It, it didn't seem to work. Oh, it, it, you know, it, it might work if you could trace back the source of the lie. Mm -hmm. uh, very, uh, and and I, I can do that for a very interesting uh, COVID myth. Um, you know, it's because I have people in my life, too, who say things like, well, you know, COVID uh, isn't real or the vaccines can kill you or, you know, it's all being hyped up, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, one of the most virulent uh, myths for a long time, and I, I think still a lot of people believe it, is this idea that there would be microchips in the vaccine. Well, I, I traced that back to see where it came from. Turns out it came from Russian intelligence. Um, the uh, Russian intelligence service, the, the, you know, the, the pumped it out to the trolls, uh, who then uh, it, it ended up on something called the Oriental Review, which is an English language journal that's controlled by uh, the Russian government. And they made this claim in this article back in April 2020. Now think about that. How far were we into the pandemic? We didn't even have any vaccines. They said that any future vaccines would have microchips in them, courtesy of Bill Gates, who had taken out patent number 060606 on this biometric technology. Then at the bottom of the story, share on Facebook, share on Twitter. By the following month, 44% of Republicans believed that that was true. Whoa. Now that straight up lie, disinformation that had an uptake to you know millions and millions of Americans within a month. And that happens to us on many different scientific topics on climate change, on uh, on COVID, on anti-vax before COVID, I, I can never figure out where flat Earth comes from. I don't think that that that's a, a, a disinformation campaign. That one might just be misinformation, you know, a mistake. But um, the disinformation, a lot of it comes from foreign intelligence. How do uh, which raises an interesting question? I mean, how do flat Earthers survive as flat Earthers unless it's? I mean. Back back in the 1970s, I was uh, in Greenwich Village, and a, a, a fellow who was kind of a local down there made the comment to myself and my best friend that the pigeons are all robots. You've never seen baby pigeons. You've never seen dead pigeons. They're robots from the planet Xenu, and they're spying on us. And that's why whenever there's meetings of famous people, uh, there's lots of pigeons. Now, he was this was tongue-in-cheek. I mean, this, this guy was kind of a performance artist. And yeah. I've turned it into a running joke on this show for yeah. 18 years now. But there's, there's now this guy with this birds aren't real thing. You know, it's become a Gen Z thing, number one. But I think everybody, you know, everybody realizes this is tongue in cheek. How do the flat earthers who are not tongue in cheek maintain right. their belief? If you could just take a, an airplane and fly, you know, five miles, as soon as you get up, you know, a couple thousand feet, you can see the curvature of the earth. 
Well, the flat earthers are not kidding. And I know because I, I flew out to Denver in uh, November 2018 and went to their the Flat Earth International Conference where there were 650 of them. And my friends had told me, oh, they're not serious. They're just joking around. They're not joking around. Here's a, uh, something interesting. A lot of them flew there. Now, so you'd ask, I mean, you just asked the question, how could they um, – uh, you know, think that after they've gotten up in a plane. It's actually, you can't see the curvature of the Earth at 30,000 feet. Maybe you're looking out the window, you think you can. You really have to get up more like 50 or 60,000 uh. feet uh, in order to see it. But, I mean, you, you raise a solid point, right? Because aren't there experiments, aren't there things that, you know, scientists can show us to, you know, make it clear that the Earth is actually flat? Flat Earth is the reason I went. It's not because they were the most dangerous science deniers, but because in some sense they were the worst, right? Because how could you imagine somebody in this day and age to think that the Earth is flat? Okay. But they reason in the same way that all other science deniers reason, and so I wanted to see if I could learn how to talk to them. The really interesting, the fascinating thing about flat Earth is that they think that the Earth is flat, that there is that Antarctica is not a continent, it's an ice wall spread out around the perimeter of the Earth, that there's a dome over the top, and so we've never been to the moon. Now, so, you know, immediately tempting, you walk into that room and you want to push back with evidence. What about the pictures from NASA? What about a ship going over the horizon, hold that, you know, goes hold down, it disappears hold first? You know, what about Newton? Uh, you know, what about all of these things that you can bring up? They've read it all, they've heard it all, and they've got a script that they will use to push back. You can find a lot of this on YouTube if you want to look, but be careful <laughs> because um, once you watch one of those videos, they'll send you 20 more. Amazing. But what happens is people watch these videos, they can't answer the questions, and they get sucked in, and then they eventually show up to these conventions. And you have to talk to them not about facts, but about why they believe 